this era all day. Hell yeah. Home rest is about to take place. Yeah. Good evening, YouTube world. I'm Paul Italia. How you doing? If you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. If you're feeling the content, smash that like button. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's special guest. He comes from the other side of the world. He has a huge social media presence in our community. My pleasure to introduce Ryan Blue Bowen. Welcome, brother. How you doing? Paul, man, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm, I'm really excited about this. I've been hearing massive things about your interviews. So I'm looking forward to it, man. But uh, yeah, I'm well. How are you? <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. And uh, I'm feeling the new studio, man. I've been uh, following you and I've seen that you've been building this uh, great studio and uh, it's looking official, my man. Oh, man. It's, it's been so much fun. The arm wrestling has supported my career and it's it's time to upgrade and start to really pump out some awesome content so this is this is just the beginning there's more to come i can't wait <laughs> i love it and i can't wait to watch the progression my friend so uh, i want to start off and i wanted to just uh get the basics want to get your stats want to get the age height and weight okay age is 36 height is six foot one and a half if i if i'm in barefoot if i get some shoes out i get the six two <laughs> <laughs> um and weight right now i'm i'm right on 210 pounds um which is exactly where i want to be for my next match wow you're getting big brother you're blowing up well yeah i mean i've, I've when i took on lachlan adair i to, for that number one rank in australia I, I i got as high as 230 um but that was like a real big effort to get to 230 my my, my normal sort of natural body system right now it's about where i'm at so 210 is comfortable so i can go 10 pounds either way pretty easy so uh what was the biggest you've ever been that was the 230 yeah the first time in my life i've ever seen anything above 220 um was for that match so um yeah i felt i felt unnatural i was breathing heavy uh sleep apnea at night all that sort of stuff doing my shoes up was like what is going on um so it was it was a big forcing of that but i mean I, I started when i started arm wrestling my very first comp uh, like i was working around at like 86 kilos so um which is what uh, what is that one 185 or 190 pounds or whatever that is um so it, it, over the the eight and a half nine years that i've been pulling i've i've, I've pretty much put on 20 pounds okay, so when you uh, when you i seen a video out there with you pulling justin bishop i believe it was about four years ago what was your weight then? Because you look considerably a lot bigger these days than you did then. Yeah, yeah. Th then I was um, I was weighing maybe uh, two o two or two o three pounds that day, and it was a really it was quite of a fat version of me too. Like Justin and I uh, agreed that whatever weight is fine, and um, and I said I'm going to get as I said to him I'm going to get as big as I can. He's like, yeah, that's cool. And as big as I can that day, like I had a big fat face and everything was. Just, uh, yeah, about two I, or three I, pounds at the time. But, yeah, I've, I've, I've changed a lot since then. Now, now I sit at 210 and I'm way leaner and way stronger than I was back then. So, yeah. Yeah, bro. I mean, you're more developed. You're, you're definitely looking a lot stronger and a lot more filled in. So, uh, whatever you're doing, continue doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I uh, wanted to start off. Uh, where did you grow up? Man, I grew up in... Um, in the Blue Mountains, uh, west of Sydney in, in Australia, which is uh, a nice, peaceful area. It was kind of, I grew up on acreage, so I, I grew up in the bush riding motorbikes and, and um, all sorts of stuff, man. But uh, western, western Sydney of New South Wales, uh, nice place, part of the world. And how did you get the nickname Blue? Yeah, that one, it's, it's, it actually got given to me when I was in the Australian Army. Um, and it comes from World War I, uh, back, back in World War I. Australian soldiers who had red hair uh, were just nicknamed Blue. Um, it's just, a, just it's like calling a big guy tiny, I guess. It's just that ironic sort of name. But I was just at the top of a rope tower one day um, in my on basic training, and the, the physical training instructor didn't know my name, and he saw I had red hair, and he yelled out, "Hey, Blue!" And um, so it stuck in the military. And it, it, so I, a lot of people thought that it was given to me in the arm wrestling world, but no, it was given to me in the when I was in the Australian Army, and uh, just carried over into the arm wrestling world. 
That's a very interesting fact. I had no idea that you were in the military. Very cool. Yeah, seven years in the Australian Army. Yeah. Uh, so you and Devin got a lot in common with that uh, part of things, huh? I, I, I was actually, you know, in what year was it? Uh, 2000 and, 2007, I think it was. I got posted uh, overseas and I spent a month at Air Force Base Trenton uh, in Canada. And I hadn't yet discovered the sport. And then when I when I did discover the sport and I talked to Devin about it, he's like, dude, I was at Air Force Base Trenton pretty much the same time you were there. <laughs> oh, like, my no. God. Wow. Okay, Small I, world. I, was 10, I was 10 minutes from Devin Larratt. I didn't know the sport existed yet. And I'm just like, <laughs> I may have even, because my, my, my role in the Army was I, I used to work as a parachute rigger. So I was preparing uh, aerial delivery equipment, parachutes and slings and straps and uh, getting ready for getting that, that ready for people to jump out of planes. And, and Devin's the kind of guy who's jumping out of planes all the time. So you never know. I might have handed Devin a parachute back in wow. 2007. <laughs> That's, you know, I wouldn't, have, wouldn't know. But yeah, so small world. So it's interesting that you say that, that you had that job in the military. Because I'm starting to think where you get all your logistics and all that, that might have a little something to do with it. Yeah, well, I, I was, yeah, I was a logistics manager sort of thing. So I, I was a, a captain when I got out. So I had a, a, a company that were uh, of, of soldiers working for me. And so coordinating all that sort of nonsense was, was my, yeah, my job. Um, I wasn't the guy packing the parachutes and that, but I was in control, making sure it all lined up. So yeah, maybe, I don't know. All the, the army definitely gave me a lot of life skills that I, that crossed over to, to my business side of things and, and i appreciate that I, I funnily enough i was not a public speaker at all when i was prior to army i was i was terrible getting up and talking and the army actually turned me into the public speaker i am i was i was forced to be able to as, as an officer i had to get up and be able to speak in front of uh, my subordinates confidently and, and execute on a plan and um that carried over into what i do now wow very interesting on that um what uh did you play any sports in school when uh, growing up yeah i was i was pursuing professional tennis that was my dream um when i was like when i was like three years old my my dad asked me what are you gonna do when you grow up what are you what are you, what are you gonna be uh what are you gonna do for a job and i said ah i'm gonna play sport and dad said no but how, how are you gonna make any money and he and i said to him oh i'm pretty sure they'll pay me <laughs> So right from three years old, I wanted to be a professional sportsman. And at age seven, I, I, I committed to tennis. I said, I said to my mom and dad, I want to, I want to win Wimbledon someday. Um, right from age seven, that was the goal, win Wimbledon. Um, and, and I started pursuing that. I pursued it really hard until I was 17. Um, when I was 17 and I finished high school, I was in the top 10 in Australian ranks um, for under 18s. Uh, I was right there on the, on the, on the, the cusp of it, but Honestly, it was my mental side of it um, that let me down. And what I, mean, what I mean by that was I was scared to lose back then. I was intimidated by the people ranked above me. I thought I just didn't believe in myself. I thought, no, I can't, I can't crack into the, the seniors. I was, I was stuck in the juniors top 10, but I couldn't, I couldn't hang with the seniors. Um, not at a level re- where I would make money. And, and when I got to age 18, I didn't want to live at home anymore. I wanted to be independent. And I was like, okay, I can either stay at home with mum and dad uh, and pursue tennis and, and, or I can go and be independent and get a job. And so I chose the army and said goodbye to the dream of tennis. But um, the physicality from tennis, I know that that translated over to arm wrestling because the, the hundreds of thousands of heavy top spin forehands that I've hit, it's exactly the same as the pronated top roll, man. It's just, it just felt natural to the table. What uh, made you get into tennis? What was, um, you know, was it your parents or anybody played? Was it influence in the tennis? To be, on- to be honest, I was a kid that tried every sport. Um, I loved it. I played everything. Um, foot- rugby league, soccer, baseball, athletics, swimming, tennis came in, among, a- among other things. And I just, I, just, I just was good at it. I was just right off the bat, I was just good at it. At age seven, first time I picked up a racket, I could, I could, I could just hit well. Um, and and it just seemed to click with me and, and i i loved i loved cricket as well I, I i very nearly uh chose cricket when i was probably 12 years old i almost transitioned from tennis to cricket because i really I, I was i was doing really well in local local social cricket i was just killing everyone um 
but tennis was tennis was it just because of my own choice. My parents were really uh, really good to me in the sense that they they just gave me the chance to play whatever I wanted, and I could chop and change, and I would from year to year. But tennis stuck with me, and I used to I used to grow up watching Wimbledon and the Australian Open, the French Open, U.S. Open, and I'd just be hitting the ball against the side of my house, uh, pretending in, in my mind I'd be I'd be Andre Agassi against Pete Sampras, and I'd be I'd be I'd hit one shot as Pete, trying to use his style and replicate his style, and then. The ball would bounce back off, and then I'd turn to a double-handed backhand and, and be Andre. And uh, and in my head, I'd, I'd count score and everything, and I'd just be like, "All right, Pete's winning, Andre's winning," and and I'd genuinely try to win the match against myself, being these two different characters in my head. And it's funny how much of that is carried over to arm wrestling because I do the exact same thing when I'm when I'm training for arm wrestling. I I go to a I go to a practice and I say, "All right, I'm going to be Evgeny Prudnik tonight." In my head, I'm going to do everything that Evgeny would do in this practice. Um, and I and I and then I get to the next practice and I say, all right, I'm John Brzezink tonight. I'm Devin Larratt tonight. And and I, and and I just I immerse myself in their style and their their the way they even down to their mannerisms at the table. I'll, I'll literally become in my mind them, and I do that to try to understand why they move the way they do. Yeah, that is a very smart way of looking at things. You uh, seem very analytic in your ways. Yeah, I think I think I definitely cross into the the category of obsession when it comes to perfecting a sporting movement. Um, obsession is is the only word I think. I, but it, but it's but I love it. I really do get a thrill out of um, trying to dig as deep as I can into understanding why things work in sport. Um, yeah, kind of. Just the way Would I'm you built. say you have a obsessive um, personality that uh, anything you do, you kind of either go yeah, all well, in or not at all? I'm all in or, or I'm incredibly lazy <laughs> to just, just ask my mom or my wife or anyone that knows me well. Um, if we're talking about the thing that I'm interested in, be it arm wrestling and building a business or a YouTube channel or just chasing the number one rank, whatever, I, I just, I'm relentless on it. I, I don't stop. I just, I, everything. <laughs> so I, I, I feel bad for the people around me sometimes that I'm constantly pushing and I have to remind myself to just press pause and let them talk about something for a while before I bring our wrestling back up. But, um, and then on the other side of the coin, yeah, I, I'm someone that if I, like when I, if I get a job this, before this was my career, if I went and got a job and I didn't like it day one, I quit day one. I didn't, I don't stick around. I'm out. If this, if it, if it doesn't feel right, I'm gone. See you later. <laughs> so, you're yeah, giving like me the it. chills when you say all this, man. It's uh, I got so much in common with you now that I'm hearing you, bro. It's the same kind of thing where, you know, I, all I know is one speed. You know, I'm going fast, supersonic, or I have no interest at all and I want nothing to do with it. There's no I, in I, between. I, I'm a massive fan of specialists in life. I don't care what, you, what your specialty is, whether it's guitar, whether it's promoting sport, whether it's art. Whatever. I, I just freaking love watching people that are freaking awesome at something. And, and I admire that so much. And, and, and I think we've only got one lifetime. We've only got so many hours we can put in. So I wanted to be a damn specialist in something that I enjoy. So, yeah, screw wasting time. Nice. Um, did you uh, go to college? Uh, just a military college. So I don't have any tertiary uh, qualifications or anything like that. Uh, the, the military gave me some, some qualifications in like logistics and personnel management, operations management. So I've got bits of paper, but I've never done anything with them and I'm not interested in doing anything with them. <laughs> yeah, so no college. Now let's get into oh, oh, when did you actually... Sorry. sorry, sorry. You say college, you talk... In, a, in the USA, college is what, high school? Or is, or is that... I'm getting my... No, it's right. the next level above high school. So after high school, you go to college. Wait, okay. We're all good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's get into now. When did you find arm wrestling and how? I, f I loved arm wrestling from as young as I can remember. Uh, I wanted to, my earliest memories of arm wrestling were against my dad when I was, I don't know, three, four, five, six. I would arm wrestle him at every opportunity. Um, and I remember on my 12th birthday, I said to my dad, when I'm 18, I want to have a $50 bet with you on who wins the arm wrestle. And he said, yeah, no worries. Um, and when I turned 18, I came along. And he crushed me. <laughs> he absolutely crushed me. <laughs> um, but arm wrestling has been part of my 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 core uh, forever. Um, I just didn't know it was a real sport. I didn't know there were organized events. I didn't know that existed. And I only discovered that at age 26 or 28, sorry. At age 28 is when I, I found and discovered that it was real. But 
I used to arm wrestle every. I, I, I remember I came home from school one day in when I was 16 years old. Um, and I said to my mom, I've had the worst day in my entire life. And she was real worried, thinking something terrible had happened. She asked me, what, what, what happened? And I said, I dropped my first ever catch in cricket and I lost my first ever arm wrestle. And, <laughs> and, I, and the thing that made it worse was, you know, when you're in high school, um, every year group matters. Like, like, like a year, kid in year 12 is a lot older than a kid in year 10 um, in, in, your, in your mind. Um, the problem was this kid was a year and a half younger than me and he beat me and I couldn't believe it. I'd cleaned up every kid in school all my life and this friggin' new kid turns up. Jimmy Coleman, I remember his name. Jimmy Coleman, if you're out there, we need the rematch. Um, <laughs> Jimmy Coleman was only bloody 15 and I was 16, almost 17, and he beat me and I couldn't believe it. It was the worst day of my life. So um, arm wrestling's always been a, uh, something I've loved doing. I, I, my dad was always the same. He was really good at arm wrestling, just natural strength in hand and wrist from being a farmer all of his life. Uh, I, I remember being at a tennis tournament again when I was probably 16 and there were these 18 year old tennis players that um, looked really buff. They were really buff. These by the, by the standards of an 18 year old, they were, they were super buff and they were arm wrestling each other. And, uh, and they were saying how they'd never been beaten. Or well, one of the guys was saying how he's never been beaten. And I'm just like, I, I, this is, I'm, I'm itching too much to, I have to, I have to, to bite on this. And I, so I, I went up to him and said, Hey, you want to arm wrestle my dad? He's just over here. Um, I reckon he can beat you. And, I, and, and I, and so they said, yeah, right, let's do it. So I went over to dad and I said, to dad, Hey, these, this guy's never been beaten in an arm wrestling. Whatever go. And dad, dad doesn't look, dad, dad's not physically bulky at all. He's just a farmer. Um, he's not a gym goer at all. Anyway, dad said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and dad just, Stonewall to do dead center and whatever. <laughs> it's just nothing. So I've always loved arm wrestling. It's been a lot of fun all my life. And um, yeah. It's, Did I just it's, see the a video of your dad uh, curling? It was like uh, 102 pounds or something like that. Yeah. 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 So yeah that, was, that was pretty impressive, bro. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's just dad. Like he doesn't, he, he doesn't pursue strength at all. He doesn't have a gym. He doesn't have a, anyone to train with in terms of table time. He's just, just strong. If you if you look well, at there's there's a, there's a few it's photos called there. old man strength. I think you just yeah. did a video on it, brother. <laughs> he's, got, he's got it in spades. He's definitely he's used his hands all his life, and his his hand and wrist is just oh, it, it intimidates a lot of people when you grip him. So, so what did uh, arm wrestling look to you back in high school? So you know, you said you discovered it in your twenties and all. I'm assuming that's when you went to a table. But before that, you were never on an actual arm wrestling table and it was no, more just like... It was not on an arm wrestling table. It was just across the bench at school or uh, once I was in the army, it was, uh, it was over the desk or something like that. Um, I, I'd love to, I wish there was video footage of me arm wrestling back then because I'd love to see what my style looked like back, back then before I, I started getting into it. Um, because I, I, I see so many people in the internet world nowadays saying, hey, it's cheating if you use your body. It's cheating if you bend your wrist. It's all this nonsense that people that just don't understand it. But from memory, the very first arm wrestling I ever did, I think it was like the wrist wrestling. It was uh, our non-arm wrestling hands were gripped up with each other. And it was, it was, it was get your own forearm to touch your, own, uh, your, own, your other arm for it to be a victory. That was how my dad uh, got me arm wrestling originally. And then once at school, it was just down to the table kind of. Yeah, and I mean, so everyone how did gets you start it. learning. Had you learned all the different techniques and all that, and who was the guy that brought you into actual formal arm yeah, wrestling was, on a table? The way that that came about was I was the uh, it was 2013, and I was the owner of a retail supplement store, and my my re wholesale resupplier, uh, he was a former a kickboxing national champion, uh, a gentleman named Mason Haydar, and um, Mason just was strong. And I, I, I challenged him one day. I said, hey, you want an arm wrestle? Just when he dropped off some supplements. And Mason crushed me. And I'm like, oh, man. Wow. And it just, it just reawoken uh, my, my competitive spirit. And I said to Mason, who came in once a month, I said, dude, when you come back next month, I'm going to beat you. And I said, and I added to it, and then I'm never going to lose to you again. And he just laughed and said, yeah, good, good luck. And so the instant he walked out the door, I got on the internet and was starting to research arm wrestling technique and and that just opened it up. I was like, I couldn't believe what I was finding. I, I saw videos of John Brzezink. I watched Pulling John. I, I saw Dennis Saplankoff. I even found the Australian Arm Wrestling Federation, which was 
at the time only a year old. So, uh, and I re- recognised that the the Australian national champion was in 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 Queensland, a gentleman named Doug Fatafay, and I'm like, shit, Doug Fatafay's numbers even listed there. I give Doug a call, and next minute, next the next week, I got the national champion in my supplement store. My dad's built me an arm wrestling table inside a week, and and then I put a beat me in an arm wrestle, get 20% off your supplements challenge and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and the ball was rolling and I was, I was hooked. And you can go back and see those videos on YouTube from exactly those moments. My, I started the YouTube channel the same week. And, uh, and I said in those videos, Hey guys, I don't know what I'm going to be doing on this YouTube channel, but I just want to bring you along for the ride. I'm going to attempt to go from nobody in the sport to national champ. So that, it ended up taking, yeah, it took about seven years to get there. <laughs> what, uh, what year was that in? 2013. 2013. So what does the arm wrestling see, um, scene look like then as far as uh, social media and like who's the, the guys that everybody knows in the sport at that time? Social media wise for me, when I got on there, there was, there was no one with a strong presence on YouTube. Gary Roberts had stopped doing what he was doing. I, so Gary had already wound up um, with his arm TV stuff. So that wasn't happening. There was pulling John was the most predominant, single video out there that I could find. Um, and there were just sporadic clips of Nemiroff and, and whatnot floating around. Um, this arm wars was probably it actually. I noticed that arm wars seemed to be the mainstay for uh, an audience. They were on Eurosports, and they had, um, they had a good viewership as far as I could, I could discern. And so straight away, I was, I was literally on the Neil pickup. I, I I'm like, researching who who controls this arm wars thing i discover it's neil pickup i discover i find him on facebook I, i'm like oh my goodness i found it's found the organizer on facebook i couldn't believe that i could find people so predominant in the sport just on social media and, and i and i messaged him and said hey what do i what do i have to do to get in into your promotion and he he said oh look i just need i just need someone who can arm wrestle under all circumstances that's passionate um and that can can put on a good show and he said look send me a highlight reel of what you do and uh, we'll see see what happens. And so I went away, and over the next six months, I collected a highlight reel. I traveled to Australia and pulled more tournaments than anyone else in the country. Um, and I got a highlight reel sent it to Neil, and a year, a year and a half later, he gave me a gig uh, to pull a Neil Najran. So that was kind of what the social media scene was like. It was really non-existent. And I straight away made the decision, like I said, in week one, that I wanted to make it a career. And I recognized without prize money being in the sport, sufficient to actually make it a career uh, that I had to create a business and a brand and a, and it's a momentum that would in time actually become my own career. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I said goodbye to watching football on the weekend, going to the pub with mates or anything. Like that. I used all my social time in to my YouTube channel and into the training and trying to document that arm wrestling journey. Cause yeah, I thought, well, it was so much fun for me to do that anyway. That didn't bother me to to say goodbye to that recreation time. Um, and yeah, I, I, I famously earned $34 in my first like four and a half years on YouTube. So <laughs> that's, all, wow. that's all. What was the, when you first started that YouTube, did you know that was going to be worth something one day or was it you just kind of just fell into it? I was convinced it was going to turn into something. I, I That's that was a big reason why I did it. I, like I said, I, I, in my head, I was like, I want this to be a career. I want arm wrestling to be my career. I'm patient and I'll, I'm willing to work hard because I, I really love arm wrestling. I was, like I said, I, I, I was committed in my own mind to working and paying the bills with the job that I had. Uh, and in every other moment of time I had for recreation, like I would be, I'd average going to bed at 3 a.m. because I would from, I'd spend time with my family from 5.30 till 8.30 at night. And then I'd go to work on arm wrestling and I would just create content and create posters and promote stuff and be in forums and, and all this kind of stuff. And like, that's where I developed my uh, conflict with Chris Gobby uh, was in that t- period of time. Then Chris Gobby saw how active I was and it pissed him off that I was this, this novice that was so talkative in the sport. And, and I remember him saying, uh, and this, this was about two years in now to my journey. Uh, he said, in a forum, he responded in a forum that um, I was nobody, I could never do anything in the sport, and yada yada yada, and uh, that he would crush me if he ever were to face me. And what really pissed him off most was Devin Larratt had met me at that stage. He'd come to Australia and done a seminar and felt what I had on the table. And he 
replied to Chris's comment and said, I'd put a thousand dollars right now that Ryan would beat Chris in a super match. And that I think was the the beginning of that that long term rivalry. And we eventually got to, to find that out for real in in uh, bottom eight, and it was it was very comfortable for me. So, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I got, I got to see that. That was a pretty uh, dominating win. That was a great uh, match to watch and all. I also uh, had my little experience with a uh, little Chris Gabby. You know, I think it was like the first couple months in. Same thing. He didn't like the, how I came into the sport so quick and was making a lot of noise and all and. You know, said a couple of dumb little things to me, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> but um, I wanted to know, uh, so when you got into the YouTube and all, was there any other arm wrestler that was doing his thing on YouTube that you kind of, like, mm-hmm. modeled yourself after? Well, the answer is no. Um, the first arm wrestler that I noticed was Artem Taranenko. Uh, he probably, I think Artem started very similar time to myself. Um, and... He, he and I, uh, we relate to each other a lot because when we talk to each other and reflect back on what we've seen evolve, um, it's been heaps. But Adam Taranenko, Top Roll King Productions, uh, he started, I think, about six months after I did uh, in terms of putting out regular content, and he's been consistent with it the whole time as well. Um, I think from memory, the next one was uh, Alex Beziaskov's Arm Wrestling TV. That kicked off probably two or three years after after mine. Um so yeah, it, but it was all, it was all, it was all the wild west. No one knew what they were doing, and it was just this, this slow and steady uh, build. And um, we all just, yeah, we, we we talked to each other occasionally back in those early days and helped each other with what was going on. But um, yeah, I, I I really do enjoy the fact, and I like being able to reflect back with those guys and and talk about the evolution of the social media side of the sport because. Uh, like De- Devin started his YouTube channel maybe four years after him. Um, and I was good friends with Devin because he'd come to Australia a number of times and he really set me on the path in terms of arm wrestling. And Devin and I back and forth for for a year at least about how do we get this YouTube thing to work? Like what's going on and all this kind of stuff. And and uh, yeah, and then it started gaining momentum and Devin started um, becoming the famous arm wrestler that he is and, the world has exploded now and the opportunities now is just like, Oh man, it's my, one of my biggest goals was always to be able to show a blueprint. I had two missions when I started my journey as an arm wrestler. One was as an arm wrestler itself. And the other was as a arm wrestling entity in terms of making it a career. And I wanted it to be a blueprint that should I ever make it to either one of those goals that you could look back through my YouTube channel as a chronological piece of evidence and a documented process that, Look, here's how I went from literally nobody in the sport to where I am as a full-time career. And um, yeah, I, I, I do that. And I had that as a mission because I wanted other people. One, one of my ultimate goals is to be able to help empower as many arm wrestlers as possible to make it a career, whether it's through their athlete, through through their, through their commentary. Um, I want them to be able to look and go, well, Ryan did this. Maybe I should try doing something similar, but in my style and, and go from there. But and I, and I think we see that now. There's a lot of people doing a lot of things that that awesome things and they get a lot of criticism for it. But that's one of the biggest things is you need to be able to ignore the criticism and you know exactly what that's like um, and you need to push forward. You just need to. So, yeah. Yeah, what I always, I always say is uh, people are going to hate on, you know, the guys that are coming, changing the game, the guys that uh, see new ways and, you know, taking things in a different direction. You're always going to have those haters, you know, any industry we get into. So, you know, when I first came in, you know, I came in pretty quickly and, you know, pretty got out there very fast. And you know, I definitely gained a lot of haters, you know, just like you. And, um, you know, but I expect that, you know, and yeah. now things are the haters are starting to get quiet. They're not as loud anymore. And, you know, they're starting to support me and all. So, uh, you know, just keep doing what we're doing, bro, because, you know, we're the ones that are going to lead the way and we're going to help progress and bring this arm wrestling into, you know, into the spotlight. And that's what we're all trying to do here. I think uh, like the, the last two years has been a fascinating case study in, in, in a time where major promotions have been unable to put together events, PAL, WAL, they were the leading two promoters two years ago and they had great events on really high production quality events and consistent. And they highlighted arm wrestling really well to the world. Um, with everything that's happened in the last two years, they've just been stopped in their tracks, dead. And without social media and all of the personalities that have been creating content and creating super matches and putting on events and just telling their own story, without those people, the sport might have just gone into the doldrums. But instead, the sport's booming. 
And and I think social media and everybody who's jumped on board uh, have done an outstanding job. And and I do see a lot of resentment from a lot of people on the sidelines. A lot of people just have taken it the wrong way and, and think that it's bad or it's unfair on, on the, the real arm wrestlers, as they like to say. But, man, we've all got the same opportunities and it's never too late and all ships rise with the tide. And, uh, man... It's, I think it's an amazing time for arm wrestling and content creation. 100%, brother. That, it's the way. It's the way of the future. It's what's going to bring us from being the way of the dinosaurs to progressing and making this sport into that. It financially makes sense for everybody to be in it and to make a career at it. And you're the one that's showing the way that, you know, I think you're one of the first that is making this into a full-time career. No, I'm, I'm really – like, I'm always very aware of how grateful I need to be to the community because – I understand that every like and comment and share has been a constant stepping stone building. And, and, and even the haters, I'm grateful to them too, because they're through their criticism. If you've got a thick enough skin, you actually can learn something from them and go, okay, this is this, what I did here, pissed, pissed them off or made them laugh or whatever. Um, you can either get upset and kind of back off and which is what a lot of people do, or you can say, even though that guy's a dickhead, uh, there's something valuable in what he was talking about. And even though he was an asshole about the way he presented it, what was it that I could improve about my production, my attitude, my whatever that will uh, help this grow. And, and you, you take that little piece of information and you, and you apply it to your next video. And the same process that I applied to my thinking as an arm wrestler, I applied to my YouTube. And that was as an arm wrestler, it was, there might be a thousand losses between me being a complete novice and me being a world champion. So instead of fearing these losses, I'm going to rack them up as quickly as I possibly damn can. Uh, and that's been the process that I've taken to arm wrestling. And I do the same for my YouTube channel and my business. I say there might be, there might be a freaking hundred or there might be a thousand awkward as hell videos where I'm embarrassed that I released it between starting a YouTube channel and being a YouTube channel that is a multi-million dollar production. Um, so I'm like, let's rack up those damn awkward videos. Call me delusional, Ryan Bowen. I don't care. I'm going to push forward. And I'm going to push forward at a rate that you probably can't keep up with. And uh, good things are going to be at the finish line. So, yeah. That's it. And um, I'm pretty much where at the beginning of where you're starting. I just started YouTube. And, you know, I'm learning as I go. You know, if you would have asked me a year ago about me being a guy on YouTube, and you know, I'd be like, hell no. You know, I have no idea what I'm doing with editing and all that. But every time, every day goes by, I'm getting a little better. I'm learning a little something yeah. new. I'm watching videos from you and I'm like, oh, wow, that makes sense. And that's why he does that. So, you know, it's a progression and anybody can get into it. And that leads me to the next question. How important do you feel for uh, the new arm wrestlers out there, or even like guys that have been around for a while, to build a social presence, a social media presence, like a YouTube and, you know, a Facebook? Do you consider that being very important for uh, today in arm wrestling? To me, it's really up to the individual and self-awareness. You got to, the, the athlete has to ask themselves what they want from the career. Do they want it to become a career? If they want it to become a career, i arm wrestling, then in the current climate, yes, it's very, very, very important because there is not enough prize money in leagues to warrant you to call it a career. Unless you're Levan, you pro, and, and even if you're Levan, it, it still might not be enough. I don't know. But there's just not enough. So yes, very important right now, if you want arm wrestling to be a career, to have a social presence. That may not be the case uh, long-term, but currently, yes. So if that's your goal, yes. If your goal is just to be a badass and just have fun, then no, you don't need a social presence um, unless you enjoy a social presence. Like, just do it if you're having fun. If it pisses you off seeing other arm wrestlers getting the limelight and getting talked about and getting more super matches and having more fun, then it might that might be enough of a reason for you to jump in. But let's be clear, it's not for everyone. It, and, and that's fine. I know lots of arm wrestlers that, that it's not for them. Like they just don't, they're not interested yet. They're incredibly talented arm wrestlers, but those arm wrestlers have to make a choice right now. Do they, given that the leagues aren't available, uh, if their, if their hunger is there to, to demonstrate their strength, then right now uh, until the leagues come back, yeah, you do need some sort of presence. It's an, it, for those people who feel really uncomfortable on camera, I, I, I feel sorry for them. Uh, and it is a little awkward, but here's the thing. I, and this is one of the reasons why I love YouTube. You don't have to be me to be on YouTube. You don't have to be you to be on YouTube. You don't have to be talkative. Look at Danny Tesh. Danny Tesh isn't even on social media and he's become a freaking regular name. 
everyone knows Danny Tesh is the god of arm wrestling, according to Neil Pickup. And it's just so you can you can build momentum and build brand without having to be someone other than yourself. So I encourage people to recognize that and just know that um, you can document your journey your way, and you can even do it silently, um, and you will gain momentum. And you will. There are just as many people out there in the world that relate to the silent guy as there are that relate to the talkative guy. There's, there's probably more. So it is, the only thing is consistency. Just just put out consistent content. And as you said before, when you put out consistent content, that's why I like speed uh, in life, whether it's in a job or content or, or losing arm wrestling matches, you need experiences at failing to get better. So just keep putting out content and you will improve it. Every video you put out, you'll slightly improve on your last one. And uh, watch other content creators. Watch what they do on a production level. Uh, that makes them stand out, that makes them have success. How do they talk? What lighting do they use? What camera are they using? How long do their videos go for? Do they have an intro? Do they have an outro? Do they put backing music on? What do their thumbnails look like? What do their titles read like? Constantly ask yourself these questions and always be looking at the people that are way better than you um, in execution and just refine those things one at a time, slowly, 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 and you'll start to see the numbers trend. So, yeah, anyone can do it, whether they... Whether they want to is the other question. But if you don't want to, don't then sit on the sidelines and bitch about the ones that are getting off their ass and doing it. That's what I think. <laughs> That's where I have a problem is with those guys. It's like, um, you know, instead of going out and doing something about it, they'd rather just stand on the sideline and just talk crap and just like, you know, oh, this guy's doing this and he don't deserve that. Well, what do you <laughs> deserve, bro? You don't do nothing. You know what I mean? We're out you doing better, stuff, making better, things better, happen. Better. Exactly. And the amount of times I've heard people say of me, Ryan doesn't deserve this match. Um, I, I, in so many matches, even before I got to the, the pro level, uh, I got it even at the novice level and the amateur level because when I was a novice, I was chasing the best amateur in my region. And when I was an amateur, I was looking for the, the, the best semi-pro in my region. And I would always get there. No, Ryan, you don't deserve that match. But here's the thing. I'm, I've got the social media presence that's got an interest for it. I'm paying to go there and I'm offering money to the, my opponent. If he can beat me, what there's no, there's no deserve in that. I'm just creating that opportunity myself. And the arm wrestler that I'm challenging, he doesn't even need to bet. I'm not asking him to put money on the line. I'm just saying, Hey, like chance. Shaw, Great example. Hey, chance. Shaw, If I come to Florida and I put $500 on the table and if you beat me, you can have the $500. Are you interested? Of course he's going to say yes. And so it's not a matter of whether people think I deserve the match with chance. No, I just created that um, from my own brand and my own business and everything. And the same things happened multiple times. And man, like Justin Bishop's another example. Did I deserve a match with Justin Bishop in 2017? No, no one knew me. I didn't exist in, as a professional arm wrestler, but I recognized at the time for me to grow as an arm wrestler, I needed to experience pro arm wrestlers. And I looked, I, I looked for pro arm wrestlers in the USA at the time that I thought I had my best chance at. I thought stylistically, I thought Justin's the guy that I might be able to do something to. But I was, I, 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 this was the incredibly deep and Justin had beaten Yana Samlins and everything at that stage. And I was just this new guy out of Australia. But did I deserve the match? No. But I paid for Justin's flights to Australia. I paid him to be there on the night. And I had a crack at him. And I got my ass kicked. 6-0, but I learned stuff and I progressed. So anyone who says don't deserve it, oh man, just shut up. Seriously. Go and start want, your own brand. <laughs> I want to bring up um, what you just brought up with the, your chance Shaw versus Ryan Bowen. I just want to tell you a little story. So, you know, when I, I just got into the sport two years back, that was actually the first super match I've ever seen. You know, I was hey, uh, yeah. watching you guys in the garage. I was, you know, watching live and all, and I was so excited and, you know, I didn't know who you were at the time, but that was when I first laid eyes on you. And you just amazed me with that because, you know, everybody there, it was like you went to the lion's den. Everybody was <laughs> against you. Everybody was talking crap. I was like, yo, this dude flew in from across the world to go and do this. And to be honest, man, like the way you looked that day, I mean, you looked a lot smaller than him. I thought he was going to have his way. And then, dude, you were like a ninja. It was like, holy crap, this kid really knows how to arm wrestle. This was like all technique and all. So, 
you know, that, that just brought back a memory and all. And I just remember, I'm like, dude, this is the coolest sport ever. I wish I could be in that garage right now, hanging out with these guys and all. And then a couple months later, I'm all up in the middle and getting to hang out with all you guys. It's definitely a pretty cool thing for me. Super cool to hear. You know, the only person in the room that was in my corner, it seemed that day, was a good friend of yours. I know it was, it was uh, Sarah Backman at the time. So Sarah was there cheering me on and giving me like, come on, you, you got this, you got this. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Awesome. And I know uh Brandon Morris, I know I heard him on the mic and you know he was oh, yeah. you know just giving it to you left and right and all and I mean I was just I was so I couldn't believe at your composure and like how you were just so I think like the first match I think you lost also. No, I got, was I got, I got hammered, hammered in the first round, yeah. And then the uh, way it, you just adjusted and like you didn't let everything going on around you affect you and I was like wow, I was very impressed that day. Definitely Got my uh, interest in you and finding out more about you and all that. Awesome, man. So uh, I also wanted to find out, because um, not too long after that, I believe, it was um, I started seeing you training with uh, John Berzink. I think you went in, like, you, you moved in with him for a while. So I was always, yeah, with, right I was always trying match. to figure out, what, like, how did that come about? Like, did you just hit him up one day? Did you guys have a friendship before that? Like, how did all that come about? Yeah, it was 2018 that I met John. Um, and it was largely thanks to Travis. Uh, I got to give credit to Travis for that connection with John. Uh, and that came about, it was like Christmas Day in 2017, maybe. Um, I got On Christmas Day, I got a call from Travis. And I'm, I, I, I'm still uh, a very relative newcomer in the sport. On a global presence, I'm, I'm not even really known other than a talkative guy in an arm wrestling forum. Um, and I get a call from Travis uh, and through Facebook Messenger. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, the legend of the sports called me. What, what's yeah. going on? And I answer the phone. And it's, hey, man, it's Travis Bajan here. How you doing? Uh, and, and I'm like, oh, I'm all nervous and overwhelmed. And Travis says to me, I, I got this tournament in Arizona coming up in February of 2018. And, and I want you to help me promote it. And I'm like. All right. Why, why, why do you want me to help me? He says, because God damn it. Every time I open up Facebook, all I see is your shit. So I want you helping me. <laughs> wow. Bro, do you know what is so crazy to me right now, bro? Is I'm literally, I didn't know any of this, but everything that happened to you is happened to me. So come two years ago, when I first got into the sport, all of a sudden, you know, I was training with Nancy Locke and Eric LaFell. You know, and um, I didn't know too many of the big athletes, but I, there was always this big poster in, in Eric Waffell's gym, and it was of him at Mohegan Sun when he beat Travis Bajan. So that was the only other arm wrestler I've ever heard before. So I heard the name before. Just like you said, I am get get a messenger call. I looked at it on my phone, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is that guy they were talking about. He's calling my phone right now. Same thing. What's up, bro? Uh, you know what I mean? I see you doing big things and all what's going on, what's your deal and all this crap. And it was right then was when we connected and it started everything from there. And, you know, I started promoting uh, some of his events and also it's just crazy how, like when you're telling me this, I'm like, Oh my God, we have a lot in common. Yeah. And so how, it, how it led to John was that um, Travis about two weeks out from the event was team up my my flights and my accommodation and he said to me uh look you can either stay at the hotel at the casino you can stay with a couple of arm wrestlers live locally listed their names off and he's and then he just just tongue-in-cheek said hell you could even stay at john brazink's house he lives only 40 minutes down the road and then he's like nah i'm just kidding you yeah, you can't stay with the goat no way whatever <laughs> anyway so i get off the phone and i'm like hmm shit john brazink lives 40 minutes down the road i'm like okay i gotta i gotta write a really well thought out polite and courteous message to John Brzezink. I wasn't friends with him on Facebook or anything. So I was like, I don't even know if he'll read it. Um, a friend requests John uh, and I sent him, a, I sent him a message and I tell him, Hey, I'm coming to Arizona there to help Travis promote. Um, I'm from Australia. And I was just very courteous and very much acknowledging that his time is, is uh, his and I respect it. And it's perfectly fine. If, um, if he can't, if he doesn't even get back to me. Um, but what I'm looking for is just a place to stay. And oh my goodness, I remember the moment getting a message from John. All it said was, hey, Ryan, yeah, you're more than welcome to come and stay at my place. It would be a pleasure to have you. And I'm just like, oh wow. my goodness. <laughs> wow. I'm like, I'm staying at the goat's house for a week. And I'm like, off, like just flat cold. Never met the dude, never spoke to the dude. And he's let me stay for a week. I couldn't believe it. 
his generosity and 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 <laughs> just it was you amazing. know you so, know it's funny Ryan is uh, I bet you we just started off a big chain of events. I bet you we're gonna have all the new arm wrestlers calling John for sake now. Like, yo, can I stay in <laughs> your house, bro? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, John. Uh, but yeah, I, so that's that's how it came about, and and I um and so much came from that one trip. So much, like I I met John. And I remember going there. I was very uh, I, I don't know. I think I was at about a thousand subscribers on my YouTube channel at the time. And I remember thinking, like John had been non-existent in the sport since the end of 2015, the WAL Championship. Uh, so he'd been out, and so we went out to 2018. Three years, no no word. In social media from the from the goat at all and i remember thinking oh wow if i could just get one interview with john man that would be a game changer for my channel and it'd be so cool to hear what john's got to say and i got to john's house uh settling in a couple of days go by and i'm like trying to think how do i ask john for, a, for an interview what do I, <laughs> I don't want i don't want to intrude i don't want to over uh, i'd stay my welcome by asking for an interview because yeah, John's an introvert. John's quiet. And he's not interested in being on camera. And um, I eventually muster up the courage also having a beer. Hey, John, you, would you be up for um, an, an interview of sorts with me? I just, I'd love to, love to ask you some questions. And John goes, eh, nah, to be honest, I've, I've been asked, I've had so many interviews. Everyone asked the same questions. And to be honest, I've just got nothing left to, to say to the arm wrestling world. Um, and so I just shelved it, acknowledged it, said, no dramas, that's all good. And, just left it at that and thought, oh, well, well, look, the fact that I get to meet John, that's still massive. Um, and uh, left it at that. And it, the last day I was at John's, I'd finished the tournament that Travis was Travis had put on. And for my channel, I wanted to film a wrap-up of the tournament. And so sitting in John's backyard uh, by the pool, set the camera up. And John happens to sit on the couch behind the camera. Just uh, he wants to watch what I'm going to do. And, uh, and I and I rattle off this this uh, wrap up of the tournament, and John says to me at the end of it, it was about a ten minute video where I just kept on talking, and he said, "Gee, you did that really well." He's like, "I could never do that," and he said, "What what what's all this about? What are you what are you trying to achieve here with this?" And six beers later, John says, "All right, I'm in. Uh, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll be, I'll be on a podcast with you." And for six months, John and I did a weekly podcast then. Um, about everything that was going on in the world of arm wrestling, and and it was that moment that my channel went like that. It was yeah. So the the chain of events, man. It's um Travis. Travis always says, "Dude, I, I should be owning half your business from that 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 link up." <laughs> <laughs> so That's yeah, funny. It's, Travis it's, wants it's, his envelope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but that's uh, the story. Let me ask you when you when you're living with the goat, you know what goes on, bro. Like, um, like, tell me a little about, like, you know, were you learning every day? Was he teaching you things? Like, what was going on I mean, during this time? You've met you've met John, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. John's a great guy. I got to hang out with him a few times. John's really relaxed, and and John in his home, I think he's he's even more relaxed. Um, John, John, it was really comfortable at John's place. Uh, it was. We still got you? Lost yeah, I'm sorry. I, yeah, it was still my low battery going on right now. Okay. So it was really, it was really comfortable at John's place, to be honest. It was um his personality. What I mean by comfortable is just a relaxed atmosphere. He's got country music playing. Uh, he's got the grill and the smoker, uh, cooking some wings or something like that. We're drinking beer, sitting in the pool, and it's slow paced. And then. We, and we're constantly talking about arm wrestling, just talking about the stories of arm wrestling, personalities in arm wrestling, drama in arm wrestling, technique in arm wrestling, just picking his brain constantly and, and we're enjoying it. And we get on the table for 10, 15 minutes every couple of hours and and execute what we're talking about. And um, and it was like that just constantly for, for for the week that I was there. It was And it would go out to the lake and go jet skiing and all that sort of stuff. It was just like, man, I can't believe how, like I said, generous John was with his time and energy and uh, looking after me and just welcoming me into his home and his wife Renee as well, the same. Um, it was, yeah, amazing. It was, to Arizona is my favorite place on earth because of the experiences I've had with John Brzezank. It's literally the, I've never had a happier feeling inside my existence than chilling with John. It was it was the ultimate beer, jet skiing, likes, music, 
arm wrestling with the goat. Literally, what? what? It don't get better than that, bro. That's a dream come true. Did I die and go to oh. heaven? I mean, <laughs> exactly. It, it's pinch yourself stuff, and and I, and to be able to call John a good friend now is amazing. Like John, John was going to come to my wedding uh, if it wasn't for COVID. He was on the invitation list. He was coming. It was just literally he couldn't. So to, to be able to be that good of a friend now with John, uh, to me is amazing. And he was in my corner at my WAL um, debut. And wow. uh, that yeah. that must be amazing, bro, to have the goat in your corner. Oh, oh my God. It don't get it's, better than that. He was just thinking about it now. Like on the, on the day, the I can't I can't underestimate the impact of John in my corner. I know John, John will say, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I'm like, no, just just your presence in the corner did a lot. <laughs> Yeah, John's presence in the corner. I'm down one zero in my opening round. John's holding up my arm, grabbing my forearm. And we're talking about what's going to happen in round two, and he's like, "You got this, you know, you got this. It's, it's just, just execute." I'm like, "Oh my goodness, you got the goat rubbing your arm down, reinforcing that you're on the right strategy. What you felt just then, there's a way around it. Go get it done." I'm like, "Man, to have the goat sit there and say that to you, you just, you don't let the goat down. Then you just, you, your belief is so high, you just go out and execute." So, yeah, John, John, John. John means a lot to me, for sure. Would you say he is um, the most uh, influential arm wrestler to you? Oh, by my, by my. He and Devin Larratt for very different reasons, but but John, yeah, John's number one. So when you were <laughs> when you were hanging out with John for that week, where um, were you, was he actually teaching you stuff? Was he like showing you like actual technique and tips and all? Um, it, it wasn't so much. There wasn't so much lessons going on, but it was it was we arm wrestled a lot and we just let the, let it flow naturally. And, and I, I, I'm a, like you said, when I was talking about my tennis days being Andre and being Pete in my head, I, I started to, to share that with John, how I would do it. And I would, and I, so I'm talking, I'm, I'm going through and saying, so when I'm prudent and I'm doing this and, and all this kind of stuff. And John's like, yeah, and I'd counter it like this. And, and so he's, so it was a live lesson without words, but with grip gripping up. So we, we, we explored so much on the table and at low pressures, you can, you can experience a lot. And clearly John could just pin me and overpower me at any point. But when we're arm wrestling at between 30 and 60% and we're arm wrestling as if we're somebody else and John's just being John and showing me all the counters John does when, when this style arm wrestler pulls in, well, this style or this style or that style, whatever. And, so, yeah, so there were lessons going on, yeah, big time. I was soaking that stuff up. <laughs> and oh, that's, John, that's amazing. John did give me one very, very, very specific lesson. Uh, and that? I remember I, I said to him, I don't know if you, I was about to say, I don't know if you know Danny Tesh. Of course, you know Danny Tesh. Yes. Danny Tesh was my Everest in Australia. Um, he was the 90 kilo champ. I was the 90 kilo rank two. And that, that bastard was just always in the way. And I couldn't, I couldn't beat him. And I showed video footage of my last matches with Danny and I'd take his wrist, I'd get him an inch from the pin and then I couldn't do anything. And he'd just grind his way back and, and pin me. And John, was, John gave me a very specific lesson on transition from a top roll to a press to close out someone like that. And he talked about speed of execution, just bravery and committing to that position. And we worked on that specifically on the table. And he, so he gave me a tool set to defeat Danny Tesh. And you know what? Danny Tesh, the bastard disappeared before i ever got to do it to him <laughs> oh no oh, <laughs> so man. i never got I never, I never got to execute i never got to execute the plan that john did specifically teach me for danny but alan guerra he did get to experience it. i did the exact same thing to alan guerra as what i planned on doing to danny tesh so yeah <laughs> wow. so i i seen a video um not too long ago i think it was uh lachlan i think he pulled danny tesh and it kind of sounded like your your match with him, where he had him like within like an inch. It looked like Lachlan was about to finish him, and then Danny Tash came back and you know pulled that very impressive win and all that. So is that kind of similar that how your guys' matches would go? Similar, but I would take Danny's wrist every time, and it'd be without a wrist that he'd stop me, and then he'd grown back. But yeah, Danny was like he was diesel. He was real slow and strong. It's just I it was like a ratchet as well. You'd you'd hit him over and it'd go click 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 click. And then anytime you retreated, it had, it had click, click, and you just, any retreat was always a mistake. Like you, you think that, oh, I'll just go over here and create an opportunity. No, it just, you just, you just slowly run out of space. You like lose everything. Yeah. The walls are just slowly closing in. You don't, you don't ever uh, get something back again. So Danny was phenomenal. I hope he comes back to the sport. I'm sure he could come back to the sport. Um, 
he's one of those genetic anomalies. Uh, if you if you if you Google or look up on YouTube, Devin Larratt versus Strong Guy, it's Danny Tesh. The first time Danny's on a table in his life, and you go and watch how much genuine effort Devin has to put in to beat Danny, who's never been on a table. And Devin's like, "Who is this dude? What is going on?" And you think, "Well, for a genuine novice who's never arm wrestled, to make Devin work that hard is phenomenal." So, yeah, where, Devin where do you? Uh... Where do you believe that Danny got a lot of his power from? Was it something that he did for work or like something in uh, his background? Nothing. There was nothing in his background suggestive of strength. He just, he's just one of those guys. Just one of those dudes. Uh, to give you another example of Danny's freakish uh, strength, I'd been training under Todd Hutchins for a year on side pressure. My elbow was getting real good. Um, I could withstand a lot. Um, and Danny asked me one afternoon before training, hey, can you show me? how you're doing your one RMs with Todd. And I, I, I warmed up and I, and I, I did a genuine one RM, uh, in front of, uh, in front of Danny, Danny. Um, and, and it was a side pressure thing. It was like 60 kilos or something I did at the time, which was solid. Um, and Danny then picked up my one RM and just 10 repped it in front of me. And I'm just like, what the hell? <laughs> his elbow was just different. His elbow was different. So <laughs> his hand, I could take his hand. His, it was his elbow. Something was going on in that man's elbow that was different. <laughs> wow. So um, yeah. you brought up that you did some training with uh, Todd Zilla. How did that all come about? And when did that happen? Yeah, that came about after my um, loss to Todd. I mean, lost to Justin Bishop. Um, I lost to Justin Bishop in late 2017. And it identified for me that I needed side pressure identified for me that my hand was already sufficient because I took Justin's wrist in five out of the six rounds, yet I still lost the match. And he just took me sideways, even though I won the hand arrest. Um, and straight away then, at, at first I was just like, I just self-managed, went to the gym and just started doing weird things going sideways. Uh, I eventually then said, oh, uh, um, I, I actually, it was when bottom eight was happening, I was going to Canada. And I was going to go to WAL uh, as a spectator in Pittsburgh uh, where he took on um, Devin, Todd and Devin faced. And I contacted Todd before I went over there and he was like, yeah, man, you can come and stop in at my place. So I stopped in at Todd's place for four or five days prior to that match with Devin. And then I drove up with Devin, um, got a lift with him to Canada for bottom eight. And so it was then that I met Todd and I listened to what he had to learn. And I asked him if he'd be my strength coach. Um, and he said, yeah, hundred percent. Um, so he gave me, uh, the program. He monitored my program for about six months. Uh, I, I spoke to him weekly, um, about what's going on. And that's where the whole 44% stronger thing came out because, um, my initial one RMs within about six months, I was doing 44% more than what I was when I started under Todd. Um, so that's where that one came from, but that I, I did that for about a year and a half of, of literally, I did exactly what Todd's program said. Uh, before I started thinking something, an evolution of that uh, that involved more table time became my natural sort of progression. And uh, as as a lot of people say, is it's a winding path. But Todd, that year and a half block with Todd has has redefined what my ace is. I used to be a, a low hand top roller as my ace. Where now I'm like, let's let's bang in the center. Let's let's put connective tissue on the line and see who's always going to blow up first. And uh, I love doing that with my opponents now. <laughs> <laughs> wow now when when you went with uh Tidezilla, do you feel like um your level skyrocketed after that did that bring you to a whole um, new level it did i i feel like it did um it it completed uh in a conditioning sense it completed a lot of the picture um there's always more to complete there's always more gaps to fill but it the side pressure was a really big gap for me at the time like i said my hand and wrist was good my pronation was my ace when I first arrived, thanks to tennis. It was already very active. Um, my 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 rise and pronation combination, good. My wrist flexion was decent, but my side pressure was lacking. So as soon as I got that side pressure, um, the people that I was balanced with took a big jump up, um, a really big jump up. Like I could, all of a sudden, I was uh, bang banging with the top heavyweights in Australia. People like Ryan the Milkman Scott and. Matarangi and all that sort of stuff. Guys from New Zealand. I had a 3 3 super match with Matarangi, someone who's 160 kilos, benches, friggin' 280 kilos, um, monster of a dude. All of a sudden, I was, 
I was in matches with them where before I was not. Um, so yeah, it, it, it advanced me quite substantially. Did it change your training in, in a way? Did you uh, adopt the full Godzilla way with uh, yeah. everything being so precision with the weights and all? A year and a half of to a T what Toddzilla wanted. Um, like I said, I, I still maintain a lot of the Toddzilla principles. Uh, I try to have a max day, a speed day and a volume day on the table now um, rather than do it in the gym. I try to make my sessions the equivalent of those. Um, so I'm continuing to refine my skills and movement at the same time as getting that same principle of work. I still do the volume in between. I do all of the supplementary stuff, the tricep work, the, 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 the bobbly weights as, as Todd used to call them uh, with bicep curls, just trying to increase the stability and just the, uh, the efficiency of the, the wide array of movements that arm wrestling is going to ask you to, to be strong in. I'm trying always working on that. So yeah, a lot of what Todd has taught me will stay with me forever. I'm sure. 